Good day. I wish to welcome all of you to our online orientation for evaluators in relation to the recognition of professional development programs. I also wish to welcome you to my session. The title of my session is The Design of Training as an L&D Intervention with Focus on Teachers and School Leaders. Allow me to share with you my PowerPoint presentation. Let me begin by sharing with you the objectives of this um, session. So my objective is for you, the participants, to be able to carefully evaluate trainings and other L&D intervention proposals using the evaluation criteria adopted by the National Educators Academy of the Philippines. More specifically, you should be able to explain the principles of adult learning and how they relate to design identify the elements and parts of a training design, distinguish between and among training methods, and finally, to reflect on the design principles as they impact on the process of evaluation. So to be able to achieve the objectives of this session, I will cover the following topics. The first one, the principles of adult learning, the elements of the training design, that's the second. The third one, the parts of the training design, and finally, other considerations involved in the design. So it's important that we know these things as program evaluators. So we begin with the overview of basic principles and framework of design of training. So we begin with the five assumptions of adult learners. These five assumptions of adult learners were developed by Knowles. In 1980, he made the four assumptions about the characteristics of adult learners, which we sometimes refer to andragogy. And then in 1984, he added the fifth assumption. What are these five assumptions? The first assumption has something to do with self-concept. And this assumption just tells us that as a person grows and matures, he becomes more independent and more self-directed as a human being. So he makes decisions. Um, independently uh, using his, his experience. And the number two, with respect to adult learning experience, uh, it, it just assumes that a learner, uh, an adult, has a wealth of experience and maybe even wisdom. Uh, and that this, um, this wealth of experience becomes the reservoir uh, for, uh, for a reservoir of resource for learning. And then the third assumption is with respect to readiness to learn. It just says that a person is more increasingly uh, deliberate in wanting to learn because uh, this is related to his task. He wants to improve his uh, roles, uh, his, his performance of his roles and tasks, whether in society, in the greater society, or in the workplace. The fourth one is on the orientation to learning. It just says that the, the adult learner is oriented towards addressing a specific problem or issue and concern in the performance of his work or, his, or performance of his role in society or in the workplace. And, and that this is, is the main um, intention for attending a, a training. And this orientation is related to the fifth, to the fifth um, assumption, which is motivation to learn. The motivation to learn of an adult is not any more um, uh, driven by external forces, such as rewards or material things. But it is more the internal desire to really uh, increase learning, to increase knowledge, and to be able to improve his or her capacity. So, uh, it is important to distinguish adult learners from, from children because, uh, because of, of these uh, assumptions. 
because we have different assumptions for young learners and we have different assumptions for adult learners. These assumptions will have implications on how we design our training activities and interventions. So what, this, what are these implications? Um, one, uh, we know that adult learners are already autonomous and they're self-directed and therefore the design should uh, promote agency. In other words, um, we need to be able to know uh, what is it that the, that the participants would like to learn. So we, we go back to what they really need. Okay? And the role therefore of the, of the trainer here, of the expert is to facilitate that learning, to, to make sure that we promote autonomy and self-directedness uh, nat uh, nature of the learner. The second um, implication is with respect to experiences and knowledge. The designer of a training should be able to recognize and respect the knowledge and experience of the participants by integrating them into the design, by integrating uh, this knowledge and experience into how we select activities and methodologies. Number three has something to do with the goal-orientedness or the orientation to learn. We know that the orientation to, to learn of uh, the adult learner is towards uh, addressing a problem or concern or improving the performance of the task. So we need to align this goal of the adult learner to, uh, to, the, to the design or we need to, to align the design rather to the goal of the adult learner and uh, and the the training should be clear on how uh, it will help the adult learner address the problems that uh, he or she has identified and number five with respect to relevancy oriented and practical nature of the learner the design should consider immediate work application so it's not enough that we give them the theory we give them the steps and the concepts but we need to be able to ensure that after the training, uh, they will be able to apply what they have learned. Okay. So now we go to the NAYAP Learning and Development Intervention Design Process. To be able to capture the, as those assumptions uh, of the adult learner, it's important that the design process should enable uh, that kind of recognition. So for NAYAP, it is important that we go through the, the four basic processes and supported by quality assurance and monitoring and evaluation. So what are these uh, subcomponents? What are the components of this design process? The, so you have assessment, designing, learning resource develop, learning resource package development and delivery. And as I said, man, um, uh, supported by quality assurance, monitoring, and evaluation. These sub-processes within the design process are distinct processes, but are interrelated, sequential, and iterative processes, meaning it allows you to go back to the processes and reflect on the processes and continue to improve. And that is reflected in, in the cyclical nature of this, uh, of this model. This intervention design process is, is a mirror of the more uh, known ADI model. ADI model includes analysis, design, develop, implement, evaluate. So all the details or the things that will be taken care of in each, in each uh, process, in each process here in ADI model, are actually the same things that the NAAP LND design process also considers. So for example, for analysis, you look at the needs, the requirements, the tasks, the participants' current capabilities, and so on. Okay. And then when we, do, when we do design, that's where we develop the learning objectives, we look at the delivery format, we choose the activities and exercises, and so on. So, and, and then we proceed to developing um, a prototype, meaning you pilot it, you develop the course materials, and then re you review and you continue to improve on the design. And then uh, once you have the final design, then you implement it uh, with tools in place, and then you evaluate um, the, the, the training design, and then you go back. So just like the LND development uh, design process, the uh, design development process of NAYAP, this is also cyclical. So 
um, so given the assumptions as well as the the processes in in the design uh, we have identified critical elements of the training design and what are these first one you must have the, a well articulated context and clear basis for the intervention so what is it what is it in the workplace that you are you are trying to uh, improve and then uh, number two uh, when we when we decide that th there's a training in in the context there's a training need based on context then you need to have clear goals and learning objectives and then from the goals and learning objectives then you define the content and its coverage so the content should address the goals and objectives and should be logically organized so once you're able to determine the key content and um, based on the objectives then you choose the methodologies and activities that promote active learning and consider adult learning principles. And then finally, you should be able uh, to measure whether the participants are able to attain the learning objectives. And that's why you need to have an assessment. So you assess the participants' um, attainment of the learning objectives, but you also assess uh, whether the training um, as a whole has met its own goals and, and objectives. So based on, on those elements, uh, we have here suggested structure and parts of the learning and development intervention design or structure and parts of the training. So you have the rationale, the target participants, um, characteristics and demographics. So it's important that you are able to target the participants, not just participants, but you target the participants, meaning that you are able to really get the profile of these participants. Um, so that you'll be able to pattern and tailor fit your, your objectives as well as the methodology and activities in the training. And then you have um, objectives. Your objectives will have two levels, the terminal objective and the enabling objective. And then number four, assessment strategies, instructional design, uh, which will have uh, six parts. You have key content, methodology, modality, or platform and platform materials, resources, evidence of learning, which can be expressed in terms of major output and the time or duration that will be required for each of the key content to be covered. Then you have implementation arrangements and management as well as materials and resources. I will discuss in detail the different parts of, of this uh, suggested structure of the training design. So begin. So we we begin with the rationale. Um, the rationale provides the context for the intervention and its necessity. So you look at uh, two um, levels of context. At the context of the individual, uh, so you look at the needs assessment. Uh, you gather data on what the participants really need. So this is where the human centeredness design. Okay, will come in because you engage the participants, you engage your, your personnel, you engage the teachers and ask them what is it that you need, what is your experience, uh, how, can we, how can you uh, be uh, assisted in terms of training or in terms of capacity building or capability building. So you use different strategies in assessing. So you can go to the teachers and talk to them. You can do standard uh, survey um, questionnaire so that you'll be able to analyze them properly. So there must be some research base in terms of, of um, needs assessment. And then, um, as I said, so that's the, at the level of the, the context of, of the individual. But you need to also look at the context of the organization. What is the goal of this organization? Okay. What does it want to accomplish? So what's, what is or what are the strategic priorities of the organization? What are the work development objectives that need to be addressed? Okay. So you need to balance the organizational goals and the individual needs and be able to come up with a design that addresses this balance that um, makes sure that while you address the individual needs you also address the organizational goals this is what you call strategic training because you are looking at the organizational goal and you're looking at the individual needs trying to maximize the individual competencies to be able to support the attainment of the organizational goals so we go to the development of training objectives. It's important to, to state the objectives very, very clearly at the beginning for at least three, three reasons. One is that the objectives, as we mentioned, will be the foundation of the design. 
Okay. So in terms of learning object, in terms of content, um, in terms of uh, instructional plans, you need to go back to the objectives. So it, it, it's also the, the basis even of the activities uh, and the methodologies that you choose. And then second, it is also the basis for, the, for assessing effectiveness of the intervention. So when you assess the, the effectiveness of the intervention, you will go back to the objectives, whether those objectives are met. And that's why it's important that the objectives are really very strategic and clearly articulated. And the number three, uh, because the objectives are already set out in the beginning, just like what I did in the beginning of this lecture, I gave you the objectives. Okay? These objectives should be communicated at the outset to the participants uh, because it will serve as a contract between the learner and the provider. Uh, and this contract will be subject to review it at the end, whether, whether the, this, the objectives as a, as a contract uh, have been accomplished and that the participants are satisfied with the, the way the contract has been carried out. So uh, as mentioned earlier, there are two levels of training objectives. You have the, the terminal objective and the enabling objectives. So you have terminal objective and enabling objectives for the training as a whole. And then you have terminal objective and enabling objective for the sessions that will be involved within the training. So when we say terminal objective, what do we mean? Terminal objective refers to demonstration of acquired competencies or combination of knowledge, skills, and attitude through the application in the workplace. It really responds to the identified competency gaps as mentioned in the context. And then this terminal objective is broken down into enabling objectives. Okay. So the enabling objectives now refers to the demonstration of component knowledge, skills, and attitude that the training intends to develop. So you break down this terminal objective into specific knowledge, skills, and attitude. And the demonstration of that, of, the, of each of these knowledge, skills, and attitude in the training it will now form part of the enabling objective. So you can see that what we did was um, to state terminal objective in a more general way because we're talking of competencies. And then you look at the enabling objectives as component parts of those competencies as demonstrated within the training. So because the training um, objective is broken down into sessions, so you have session objective, uh, usually what we do is that the terminal objective for the session level objective is the enabling objective under the training level objective. Okay. And then, um, so this is, so it's mirroring the enabling objective and then, um, and then you translate the terminal objective of the session level into enabling objectives in terms of specific behavior along knowledge, skills, and attitude to be demonstrated during the session. So it's more, it's more specific now when it comes to the session because you're looking at specific demonstrable or demonstrated knowledge, skills, and attitude. So for example, for, for a training objective, you have uh, to choose and use effectively appropriate strategies and methods in teaching, reading, taking into consideration learner diversity and context. So here we are uh, looking at application already okay, and choosing and using um, appropriate strategies. So for the participants to be able to do that, uh, they need to be able to differentiate under enabling objectives. They need to be able to differentiate the different strategies and methods in teaching reading to analyze learner context and diversity and to match learner diversity and context to appropriate strategies and methods. So you can see that we just broke down the terminal objectives in, through, in three enabling objectives to make it more manageable. And then for a session, um, we are looking at as I said, for example, if we're looking at this particular terminal objective, which is taken from the enabling objective in the training objective. Um, so we say, for example, to differentiate the different strategies and methods in teaching reading, and the particular enabling objectives will now reflect the demonstrable behavior. So for example, identify strategies, point out unique characteristics, analyze strategies used in example instructional design. So we have three types of objectives as well. We have the feel objective or attitude objectives, do or skill objectives, think or knowledge objectives. So feel refers to, uh, 
to well uh, well attitude uh, feeling okay feeling and then do refers to what what the participant should be able to do and think in terms of uh, uh, knowledge process processing the knowledge okay so mental processes um Karen Lawson in in her trainer's handbook second edition has provided us with a sort of matrix for for uh, related action verbs that are associated with certain learning types. So for example, um, for attitude development uh, learning, then you can use um, action verbs such as evaluate, decide, pick, select, criticize, choose, assess, analyze, adjust. So you can see here that the verbs have something to do with um, value judgment, okay. uh, ascribing some value and making decision based on the value that, um, that they have seen in in uh, some in the things that we are presenting to them so for skill development if you look at the action verbs you look at you you have verbs like compute construct copy count so these are really skills you know, are things that can be done and can be uh, observed right away for knowledge development you can have cite compare contrast define so these are really mental processes that you cannot you cannot really um, see in terms of um, in, in terms of actual process inside the mind, but uh, there must be some, some way to capture the process. And, and that's why it's important to have very clear action verbs in the objective. So what, are, what can be some guidelines that we can observe in stating our objectives or developing our objectives? One is that um, you need, we need to state our objectives in terms of participant behavior so it's not from the from the facilitator's perspective it's not from the training perspective but in terms of the participants what will the participants do so for example they should explain they should uh, uh, construct they should be able to cite they should choose and so on other than behavior karen lawson also includes condition and criteria so when you talk of condition, I will explain condition and criteria later on. Um, so if possible, include knowledge, skill, and attitude objectives. As soon as, um, if possible. So what are the components of the learning objectives or of the training objectives? It can have three parts. No? You have the behavior, condition, and criteria. So the behavior refers to what the participant should be able to do. Okay, so like explain at least three reading teaching strategies. And then number three, condition, it just refers to what tools or assistance or setting um, under which the behavior of the participant will happen. So, so after listening to the video lecture and using a mind mapping tool, so you have a tool. Okay, so this is part of the condition. And then it's important to also state the criteria within the objective, like covering basic characteristics and features uh, in relation to learning theories and appropriate application. So, uh, so these are the components um, that we need to strive, that we are going to look for in the way the objectives are stated. Okay, so how can the, so then we go to the content. So given the objectives, what are the content? What can be the content of the, of the training? So, the general principles for determining content include, one, um, the content will flow naturally from the objective. So, the objective will tell you the scope of, those, of the content that will be required uh, for the learners to know within the training. Number two, it should focus on what the participants need to know. So you have to be very strategic. You don't have to cover everything. Okay? You need to really determine the must-know part because what we want to avoid in the determination of training content is, to, is cognitive overload. We don't want to provide as much information that participants cannot anymore handle and that will, rend that will render the training ineffective. So how do you organize the content? Um, well, well, is that no, there's no hard and fast rule. There's no, no hard and fast rule. So you need to research on the content topics. You need to know uh, what is the coverage, what is the scope of this particular topic. You need to 
and also you need to find out whether the, this coverage will be enough or or will be too much the other way is once you've done the, the the research then you can do mind mapping okay you can do mind mapping and and find out the relationship the interrelationship of this uh, content with each other okay? just like this in this particular case you have see here time management and what are the concepts that are the other concepts that are involved in this big big topic which is time management and from there you can see already the interrelationship of of the different component concepts of this uh, particular topic so you can look at different approaches to content organization one way to look at those will be easiest or most difficult or from simple to complex it can be procedural sequence so what's the first step second step third step and so on or it can be from specific to general sometimes we call that the inductive method until we're able to lead to to lead to the bigger picture or we give the big picture first and then you break that down to more specific um, um, this more specific details okay. or it can be thematic so you look at the you look at your topic list of topics then you try to affinitize you try to group certain topics that are related to each other and then arrange those topics maybe and then you can maybe you can look at what is more specific what is is this procedure or easiest to most difficult or simple to complex or some other way of logically organizing your content so the next step is choosing methodologies and activities it's important to remember that adults learn through different modalities and that according to the 70 20 10 model adults learn better if it's based on experience so if it's more related to experience and application then it is better and that people learn and develop through structured courses and programs and 10 percent and um and, and it, more of their of how they improve themselves in the workplace in the in the role that they are playing in the workplace or even at home or in the society will be uh how they interact with others and how they actually apply in the workplace what they have learned so that's 70 20 10. the percentages can vary you know we can um although this is based on research on how we develop how, on how the researchers develop the leadership uh, capabilities of of american leaders uh so this this is valid to a certain point but of course this was done um, in the 60s so so or, or thereabouts no? so it, it's it's um, a long long way from the past but uh but maybe this this uh these percentages you know, the allocation of percentages can be a very good guide for us it can vary it can change but it's a very good insight uh to say that it's more experience and how people apply what they have learned that will matter most okay so um the 1960s the national uh, training laboratories institute created this learning pyramid it just tells us how uh, people retain how much they retain when they're exposed to certain uh, teaching methods and it says here that the more that the participants are actively involved in the training or in their learning the more that they retain knowledge okay? and um, the more passive like lecture reading and so on the less that they retain maybe it's not exactly this uh, but what i find very useful is actually teaching others so teaching others can really retain uh, better okay? because well of course it presupposes that when you teach others you have already the basic concepts so you already have the practice by doing and so on so that you master it and when you master it you teach others it it it's uh, retained better that way okay so this is also reflected in edgar dale's cone of experience and edgar dale says um people generally remember uh things when when they read here and so on and so forth just like the learning pyramid but what's uh what's interesting about edgar dale's cone of experience is that he also identified learning outcomes or objectives that you can actually use when you develop your when you develop your activities uh, and your learning objectives all right of course we also know that people have different perceptual modalities meaning what is your natural tendency when when you are presented with a stimulus some people are visual so they 
they would they are attracted to to things that they see some people are auditory reading and right and kinesthetic and so on so this also affects their learning style so what is the best way that they actually accommodate information is it by auditory or by listening is it by looking at it is it by reading and writing is it by kinesthetic some people some groups have developed seven learning styles that are actually based on the perceptual modalities as developed by Fleming and Mills. But for simplicity, we just uh, stick to the four learning styles at the moment. And then you also have Howard Gardner's Multiple Intelligences Theory, which looks at the different natural intelligences of people. So some people can be smart when it comes to words, it comes to numbers, it comes to body movement, it comes to interrelationship, and so on. So, um, so we need to be able to consider this when we look at those activities that we want to include in our training activities. So what are the common training methodologies? So you have lecture, workshop, or structured learning experience, and so on. So I have here a table that looks at the usual or the common or typical structure of lecture, of workshop, of 4As, and then the features. Of course, the lecture is the most popular because it's the easiest to prepare. It's expert-driven. However, it does not mean that the lecture will be always boring because sometimes, or in many cases, some lecturers are really effective because one is that they are really animated, they're really good lecturers. Uh, you will learn a lot from them. But of course, we know that according to the cone of um, learning, the learning pyramid, we know that when, when we just listen, uh, a lot of these things can be can fall between the cracks. Um, so you just retain a very small portion of what you have learned or you have, what you have heard. Okay, but, but it doesn't have to be boring. No, lectures doesn't have, lecture don't, doesn't have to be boring. You can incorporate certain activities between lecture as part of, of, the, of the lecture discussion. Workshops are really suited for skills training. So it, this is more output oriented and performance. It looks at performance, and to a large extent, learners are actively engaged because they're the ones that are doing, following the instructions of the trainer, for example. And then for ACE, while this is the most popular among the, well, actually, this is also among the most popular in depth ed because a lot of people are using this um, for ACE, right? Um, activity, analysis, abstraction, application. But sometimes, because people don't really understand what what this is all about, what is structural learning experience, as well as, as its theoretical underpinnings, it, it, it becomes um, a, it has been reduced to, to script. It's been reduced to a series of activities without real, um, real use or application of the structured learning experience. So this will require a different, a different uh, session maybe. Okay, so, uh, so for Bettina Stanulis of Providence Care, uh, she uh, differentiated two types of training. You have the skills-based training and the theory-based training. So skill-based training, of course, is more workshop. This is more workshop, and then theory-based training can be more of lecture and sometimes for A's as well. Okay. okay. So. Um, within a design, within a lecture, or within workshop, or within 4As, you can diff, we can actually um, employ certain learning activities and structures uh, that will enhance the design to, to be able to effectively um, uh, deliver the training. So you have role play, simulation, cooperative learning, games, lecturette, demonstrations, peer learning, task exercise, Case study, small group discussion, writing exercises, reflection activity. Each of these activities have their own procedure. Uh, there are research, body of research, there's a body of research that can uh, show the effectiveness of these activities. And there are, there are books and references that you can read to be able to uh, know in detail, understand in detail what these learning activities are. But many of these have been used in a lot of our training programs and activities in that ed. So Karen Lawson again came up with this uh, matching method to decide uh, matching 
sorry, to this, uh, came up with this sort of table to show the match between methods to desired outcomes. So for example, if the desired outcome would refer to knowledge, then you have suggested training methods such as textbook, lectures, small group discussion, games, computer assisted instruction, videotape, and so on. So, um, so you have, so it's important that we're able to match methods with desired outcomes because this is how we actually maximize learning. So, um, so we need to be able to really choose the methods. The program that you are going to evaluate should be able to carefully choose the method that will address desired learning outcomes as expressed in the learning objectives. So what are the considerations in selecting the activities, the learning activities? So one, subject matter. Some subject matter can lend themselves to a specific um, activity. Okay, so knowledge of the participant, how much do they know about the topic? Sometimes if they know already the topic, then maybe that particular activity can be, can, can, can be applicable or not applicable. Of course, objectives. When you select the activities, it's important that you know what the objectives are. Okay, because they really dictate the subject matter as well as the um, activities, the learning activities. Time involved, how much time do you have? Group size, how big is the group or how small is the group? Because sometimes some activities are really meant for a certain group size. Then you have level of participation required. The equipment available, so what do you have? Are they available? Can you actually move them? Then learning space, uh, how big is the space or how small and whether you're, what is the, the learning space requirement of those activities and what do you have as a learning space. Then what's the cost? Is it expensive or, or uh, cheap to conduct that activity? The comfort zone of the trainer and the participants. So you need to know whether the, whether the participants um, are, for example, in, in four A's. It, with that will require some self-disclosure. Will, will the participants be able to, to disclose, to share personal experiences with others? So there's a level of trust that will be required. As well as the trainer, what's the experience and the expertise of the trainer? Maybe if the trainer has been doing this for a long time, so it's, he's going to be comfortable doing it again. Or if, he's, if this is the first time, maybe he needs more practice. So. And then learning styles and perceptual modalities will be so these are the considerations in selecting activities. So we go to, and then, so the next th thing is, how do you deliver the training? So you consider delivery modalities. Will this be face-to-face -face or will this be remote learning using applicable platforms? Are you going to use e-learning or distance learning? Um, or is this going to be blended? Will it be face-to-face -face with remote learning as well? And then you choose the delivery platform. So if it's face-to-face, -face, usually it's classroom training. Okay. But if it's blended or it's, it's remote learning, you can actually use online platforms such as learning management system, like uh, you have MS Teams, for example, or the social media. You can use the social media as a platform. Or are you going to use broadcast technology to deliver your, your training? Or are you going to use telephony, the telephone and the short messaging system? Or it can be a combination of these platforms. And then uh, we go to assessment. So assessment strategies can be a way to bring out the evidence of learning. So we have at least three types of three basic types of learn of uh, diagnose of assessment uh, based on purpose. You have diagnostic, which is done as we know before we do the training or we do instruction to find out where the learners are. So the diagnostic part can form part of the, or the diagnostic assessment can form part of the needs assessment. Then you have the formative, which is really happening within the training itself to be able to help the learners maximize learning. And then, of course, summative, if you want to now give, um, to, give the, to assess the learners uh, learning to, so that you can make some evaluation uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, how far they have gone uh, in terms of the content. And then th you have two forms of assessment at the moment. You have the formal or traditional assessment or the authentic assessment. 
I have come across this uh, this sort of framework for choosing assessment strategy. So this is more related to uh, clinical practice, but we can actually uh, extrapolate some parts into training of teachers. So here, what it shows you is uh, in the continuum from traditional to authentic, okay, uh, you choose the assessment method based on what you want to find out, whether what you want to know, how much the participants know or understood, so you, that's recall or knowledge, so your assessment method can be multiple choice or short answer. If you want to find out what the participants can do, so you're looking at the skills and attitude at the same time integrated into context, then you can use direct observation or practice portfolio or workplace-based assessment and narratives. So it's, it's really a range of a range of assessment methods that you can use depending on what you want to find out. Okay. It can be a very good um, and useful guide for the design. And then what, what follows next will be the learning resource package. So what will the resource package include? It can have session plans, handouts, other resources, presentation slides, audiovisual presentations, references, videos, activity materials, worksheets, others. So these resource packages can have their own uh, process of development. So I don't, I don't, um, I will not include them in, in further detail here. Um, in other words, I will not discuss them in detail here, but you can, you can actually, they can, this can be subject to another session, but you can actually look uh, for resources that will help you understand what these resources are and how they are developed okay, in other references. Okay, so we go to monitoring and evaluation. Um, monitoring and evaluation ensures feedback and continuous improvement of the intervention. So this requires that you have an M&E framework. I have an M&E framework in the next slide, so I'll show you how it's done. And then you need to be able to develop your instruments at each level. Instrument for data gathering so that you can do your M&E. Okay. So it, you should also need to make sure that if you have the instruments, then you have the mechanism to administer those instruments and gather the instruments to capture and analyze the data at each level of M&E objectives. So I have here an ex So this is actually um, in, in consonance with Kirkpatrick's levels of M&E. So you have reaction level, learning level, the behavior level and the results level. So reaction is the lowest level of m and &E, and then the results will be the highest level. So using the Kirkpatrick's levels of m and &E, so we have here what we call the results-based m and &E plan or framework. So you have this uh, framework has different parts or components. You have level of objective, statement of objective, key indicators, data requirements, means of verification, and timeline. So you have, um, so the level of objective can be impact, result, behavior, learning, reaction. So this is, this is uh, consistent with Kirkpatrick's levels of m and &E. I just added impact because what we want to know also is uh, to what extent our intervention has contributed to the greater organizational goal. Okay, so that's the impact. And then for that impact to happen, we need to find out what the result is. So what is the outcome of the change in behavior as a result of the intervention? So example is improved professional practice. And then um, at the level of behavior, what competencies should they demonstrate? Are they actually demonstrating or applying the, or uh, showing that behavior that we desire as a result of training? And then uh, that the level of learning, which is at the training level, at the training itself. So it can be done um, within the training or immediately after the training. At the end of the day, you ask yourself, so what behavior along knowledge, skills, and attitude are the participants already able to manifest during the training? Okay. Usually, the learning is knowledge um, in terms of the in terms of feasibility of assessing, of uh, assessing what the learners have learned in a particular training. The skills can require some extensive preparation. And then reaction, what is their perception of the activity in terms of responsiveness and efficiency? 
along these objectives, you need to be able to state the key indicators and the data requirements. Because the data requirements then will tell you what instruments are you going to develop to be able to get or obtain this data. And then you have the means of verification and the timeline or when you are going to conduct this particular M and E activity. Okay, so I think I'm down to my almost last, um, last part, which is the implementation arrangement. The implementation arrangement and management will cover the organization of your program management team and articulating and specifying their terms of reference. So you will involve technical experts and the management um, experts as well as the administrative support. Then you will also look at the budgetary requirements of the training when you implement the training or the intervention. And then you look at administrative arrangements such as logical, logistical requirements, how you move things, what are the, the supplies that will be needed and the equipment that will be needed, and what coordination mechanism are you going to implement so that the training implementation will be smooth. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, this quotation from Dwight Eisenhower is very relevant. Let's see, plans are nothing. Plans are just documents. They can be guides. But you, can always, you can always deviate from your plan. So that's why plans are nothing, which is an exaggeration, really. But planning also is everything because you need to be able to really think about how you are going to develop um, your, your training design and how to implement it at the same time. So planning is everything. Because it allows you to go through that process of really understanding what is involved, okay, what does it take to be able to develop a training design and to implement a training for the teachers. Okay, so I guess that's it. I hope that my topic and my lecture here um, is able to help you get an overview, at least an overview and some level of understanding of how a training is designed and how it is developed and what are the component parts. So that will be able to really look at the program proposals critically and evaluate them and uh, provide some uh, value into the component parts as you uh, assess those parts. And so that will be able to provide responsive and um, and aligned, well-aligned and integrated professional development for teachers and our school leaders. Thank you very much for taking on the role of evaluators and thank you very much for participating in this session. God bless everyone.